Hi, my name is Melody No Surname. Hi, Mel. I have a crippling fear that has plagued me for most of my life. From the day I was born, I've had this irrational fear. Even the name of it makes me jump out of my skin. But if I'm here at this rubber band fears club, I really should try to get over this. I'm scared of unnecessarily shaped rubber bands. You mean like silly bands? WHERE?! <laughs> The Nintendo DS. Do I need to introduce you to, or are you acquainted yet? In 2004, Nintendo released their next big handheld. They started back in the 1980s with the Game & Watch handhelds, some of which had two screens. Then they went to the Game Boy, downgraded by removing a screen. Then the Game Boy Color, upgraded to add color, downgraded to make less of a brick. The Game Boy Advance and the Game Boy Advance SP. But you know what all of these were missing was a second screen. I've talked about it before, but the DS was a huge seller. Over every variant of the DS, like the original, the Lite, the DSi, and the DSi XL, there are 154 million of them. That's roughly 14 DS's for every Ohioan, or uh, 154 million for every me. With a big player base, naturally, comes a big game selection. Publishers are more willing to push their games on whatever is the next big hardware of the generation. But with that much competition, there's bound to be some more interesting titles trying their absolute best to stand out. You can't just make children get excited over a game, they have to be interested in a confused sort of way. Of course, the DS had its fair share of standard Nintendo fare, Mario, Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Kirby, games that are common as you can get like sports titles and minigame compilations. But the further you dig into the nearly 3,500 games this console has across all regions, the more interesting the games become. Hi, I'm Melody and Surname, and today I want to show you all some of the silliest, weirdest, and most interesting releases on the Nintendo DS. I'll have three categories for these, as foretold by the ancient stone tablets I found in my yard. They also told me I have Legionnaire's disease, but we're focusing on one thing at a time here. The categories are weird gameplay and or design, weird story story, and weird inclusion. Let's start with weird gameplay and design. The ancient stone tablets in my yard told me so. Have you ever played Smash Brothers? There may have been a question lingering in your head about a specific stage called Hanenbo. Would you be surprised if I told you that's not uncommon? It's considered an epidemic. Electroplankton is a Nintendo DS game released in 2006 here in North America and 2005 in Japan, where it was called Erect... Erectoropurenkuton. This sounds really racist, but I can't find anything to say that it's not what it's called over there. This is less of a video game and more of interactive art. You use the DS stylus to draw lines and move parts of the environment, which these little plankton interact with, causing music to play. The places in which you make these tunes are incredibly serene and beautiful. It's such a calming experience to play around with the world you're given to create something unique that no one else has heard before. It also has another mode aside from the standard gameplay of moving a leaf, being where you can just play some calming tunes through the pre-made demo type songs. This game was published by Nintendo and single-handedly developed by Toshio Iwai, whose name is on the cover art. You boot up the game and you have a fresh start to make something only those around you can hear. Though if you got it in Japan, it came with headphones so you could gatekeep your sounds. As said by Toshio, he didn't want this to be a tool, so therefore there are no save features. A save feature would both overcomplicate the concept as well as diminish the artistic value and the uniqueness of of the sounds you could play every time. If you wanted a music creation software on the DS, there are the Korg games, which were actual music production tools. If you wanted to just jam out, there were at least two different ways to do so, like DS Vision or the Nintendo MP3 player. This game was received well, but it was incredibly hard to find in stores, only being available online and at select Nintendo stores. As a result of very few brick and mortar stores carrying it back then, it isn't exactly the cheapest game around. I think the weirdest part of Electroplankton is that it was given the A for mentioned stage in Super Smash Bros. Brawl on the Wii called Hanenbow, after the Hanenbow feature in the game. Of every stage in Smash, hell, even an ultimate, which it came back for, it is one of the weirdest inclusions. It is such an obscure game that most people would overlook it as some artsy fartsy bullshit. But I think it's incredibly weird and interesting, so it's obviously here for a good reason. Also, the Smash stage can be green screen, so I'll add something behind this and it'll be really funny. Sans is a black man skeleton? Did you know that the Nintendo DS had a microphone? Of course you did. You played Mario Kart DS Battle Mode just like everyone else. Very few games took advantage of the microphone feature. The fourth generation of Pokemon.
WarioWare, Fossil Fighters Champions, and even Electroplankton does. It's a pretty underused feature, but I found a game that uses it and fits here really well. Soul Bubbles is a very odd puzzle game released in 2008 where you have to transport spirits across terrain by encapsulating them in bubbles and blowing them around using the... Hold on one second. I'm sorry, what? There, there's no microphone use in this game where the main character blows air. Okay, thanks for ruining a bunch of blowjob jokes. The most refreshing breath of air on the Nintendo DS. They have to have at least thought about using the microphone, right? Come on. On, let me spit all over my touchscreen, man. In order to transport the souls, you draw circles around them, creating bubbles, and blow on them using the stylus. You tap one part of the screen to have your shaman apprentice move there, and then you draw a line to blow. The further the line, the harder the breath. There's a lot of terrain that can hurt the souls, like fire and pufferfish, that you must use more bubbles and a mask ability to get around. The end goal is to get the souls to these things called a gateway cube, where they can finally rest in piss. This game is incredibly beautiful. Its music, its art style, it feels so odd. It's fascinating that I've never heard anyone talk about it. Maybe it's the cover art, which over here in America is a bit odd. At least the European box showcases that it won an award. What did we get? A blemish. Yes, this game was only released at Toys R Us, meaning its sales were limited and its face was forever scarred with a tattoo of its deceased wife. Squishy Tank is a really silly match the same colored blocks together puzzle game released in 2010. The plot follows these tanks with Fumo-esque faces who know that they're in a game. Regardless, they've been recruited in and now must suffer the consequences of war. What kind of game are we in? Hopefully a cool samurai game f featuring squishy tanks with faces as the main characters, right? Matching blocks results in the tanks getting blown the fuck up. You follow this drill sergeant's orders, getting rid of a certain number of blocks of certain colors. This is all in an effort to get the tanks to become stronger, less squishy if you will. When you blow up the blocks on screen, the tanks make weird anime girl noises as they get thrown around. Which is one of the reasons I think I could never play this game in public without breaking my DS in fear. There's other features in this game, like, for example, you can customize or poke the tanks. The humor feels a lot like something out of an anime I would have been shown clips of by a classmate in middle school that I would have had to sit awkwardly through until it was finished playing before saying, Wow, that was really funny. And I mean that in as good of a way as I possibly can. Oh, hello Type 90 tank. I find this to be incredibly engaging, but I think I have a severe case of puzzle game bias, as I adore puzzle games. Squishy Tank is a take on an otherwise pretty common type of game with enough uniqueness to it that I think I can say that it's basically its own thing. Looking at the front of the box, Okay, and now to the back of the box. We see that drill sergeant, who's pretty cool. There's a nurse whose power-up gets rid of one block, so she's pretty useless. There's a baby tank who confirms that this game supports the use of child soldiers. That's pretty cool. Uh, good game overall. I figure I should also take the time to acknowledge that a lot of these DS games have trailers that are still up online, and for the most part, the comment sections are pretty dead, so let's check squishy tanks. Maybe we can liven it up a little bit. Doesn't look fun. Yeah, because it's a puzzle game. Oh, wow. I, I need a minute to think about this. Well, fuck you guys. I don't care if your comment is 10 years old and if your YouTube channel is inactive. I'm mad. Bad opinion. TBH. Now, I was doing some snooping around online for various Squishy Tank related things, you know, like B-roll and visuals for while I talk. I thought that none of the games that I would be talking about would have any form of merchandise or fanbase. They're obscure, so I expect very little. Squishy Tank not only has little stress ball things that are considered rare, but there's also a tutorial on how to make your own Squishy Tank that's on YouTube that has 42 
thousand views. Is there more to this game that I'm unaware of? No clue, but hey, I bought a squishy tank and if he arrives in time, he'll be tortured on camera. If not, I'll post a video of his abuse on Twitter. Hey everyone, um, Editor Mel here. Um, I, I, I did in fact, uh, get the squishy tank. Uh, <laughs> I really like the do not eat. And, uh, I, I just wanted to show him off real quick. Uh, I've been working on this video for like two months. So you're watching something that I edited like in like July. Uh, there you go. This is pretty fun. Um, also, it smells very strong of, like, a perfume, but I have no idea what the fuck it is. Uh, overall, pretty cool. Um, smells good. Uh, it, it is, in fact, squishy. I'll give it that. It is, in fact, fucking squishy. Well, all right. I guess it's about time to, like, get a snack or something. Oh, God! Soup! <laughs> <sighs> The, the, uh, hey Preston, listen, do you want to test drive my new car? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Wait, do you even know how to drive? Uh, yeah, of course I do. I live on my own and I'm 22 years old. What do you think I do to get around everywhere? Bike? Yes, that's exactly what I think. Okay, what's the first thing you want to do to start the car? Don't fail me now. Driver's Ed's Portable is about as much of a game as 52 card pickup, except one of them has skill involved. It takes practice. This game has two things you can do with it. One is that you can learn about a car and its parts, what to do if something goes wrong, how to fix it, yada, yada, yada. Two, take a driver's ed test created in 2008. It's all presented with this nerdy ass motherfucker. White button up, bow tie, pins in his shirt pocket. This is my dream man. Do not hit me up unless you look like this. The music in this game is really silly. It's overly dramatic and sounds more in line with a sad or thoughtful moment in a visual novel. So if this song is up your alley, there is one more from this game that I would love for you to listen to. This game also lacks sound effects, meaning you're stuck listening to this one song that doesn't even loop properly for as long as you're willing to try to learn how to drive a car with a DS in your hands. So, now that you've started the car, what's the next thing you're gonna wanna do? Floor it? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah! Uh. Floor it. In reverse. I would, but my legs are too short. I would like to know if there's a person out there who owned this game and used it for learning how to drive a car. If you're out there, Driver's Ed Portable Certified Driver, let me know. I would like to study your brain and see how much you pay for car insurance. So, did you learn anything? Uh, not to tape a puppet's hands to a steering wheel for a visual gag. The Auto Runner. A test of your wit and speed. To watch a character move, making what is essentially a quick time event every few seconds to jump, duck, and move. The precision in your timing needed for some of these cannot be understated. One split second off and you're back to the start of the level. The Auto Runner has many types. The Infinite Runner. The Infinite Flyer. The Mario Mobile Game. The Lay Funny Meme. The fucking Christ this game fucking sucks oh my god ivy the kiwi with the question mark too ivy the kiwi released in 2010 here in north america is not necessarily an auto runner but listen man this is ivy and she won't stop running you can't stop her and that's the challenge it's considered a platformer sometimes even a puzzle platformer but like come on look at her what is she doing and is it done manually by the player no this is an auto runner. As the plot goes, Ivy was abandoned by her mom and is crying and running and won't stop crying and running until she either dies or finds her mom. To be fair, I would abandon her as well. She fucking sucks. You draw these ramps that look like Ivy, the plant, not the bird, to lift her up and help her traverse the stages, avoiding rats and other enemies. The bitch dies in one hit. She drowns to one drop of water. She is still in her shell. Baby ass bitch. I hate her. It wasn't until I watched the trailer for this game that I realize that you're intended to launch the bitch with your lines. And I don't mean by pulling the lines back. I mean by swinging it around and launching her. It just seems like abuse. Which is fine by me. 
Like, this game is incredibly frustrating. I don't care if it's because I'm bad at video games. This is not easy. You think you can do better than I can? Okay, smart guy. Let's see you take a crack at it. It took me about a week of playing it off and on to get every level complete. Not even 100%. I bet the speed runs for this game take hours, if not days. I'd probably have the world record if I tried recording it. Never mind then. I think ignoring how aggravated I got while trying to beat this game and its completely unfair difficulty spikes and dips, it's completely beautiful. I love the art, the color choices, and the music in the game. Rat Woods is one of my favorite songs from the OST, and I plan to use it in as many Halloween specials as I can. Regardless of how interesting the way this game plays and how nice the art is, it's just so annoying. Stop running! This game is also on the Wii, with motion controls now being utilized instead of a stylus. This is even worse. This was a terrible idea. But what about a mobile port? That should cement this as an auto runner. It's playable on my cell phone. Just kidding. Neither version of this, paid for or not, work on my phone because it's too new. This is a Samsung S8. This is practically an ancient stone tablet in the eyes of an iPhone user. I gotta contact the company that made this, maybe I can convince them to update it. They have zero employees, yet they are not defunct. Fascinating. You know what? I'm gonna spoil the end of the game. I'm so fed up that I don't want people to play this game, so I'll ruin half of the reasons why anyone would. To answer why there's a question mark in the title, she's not a Kiwi, she's a Phoenix. Fuck this game. The man who made it should be put behind bars. Who produced this thing? Oh, he may not be paying for the correct crimes, but I hope he serves a separate life sentence specifically for this game. On to DS games with weird stories, as in development or background behind the game and not in the games themselves. The first one I want to talk about is the Japanese McDonald's training DS game. The E-Crew development program, alongside a special DSi variant, were given out to Japanese McDonald's employees in 2010. The thing was developed by, get this, McDonald's. It was published by, get this, McDonald's. A bunch of people in-house at McDonald's Japan got together to create a training game that's only legacy is being lost media followed by being the most expensive DS game to ever exist. It's not known how much this was used or for how long. For all we know, it could have been a dead-end idea from release and was rarely ever used. This isn't the first or last of its kind, you know, a video game made to train employees of a restaurant. A personal favorite example of mine in this genre that was also formerly lost media is the Burger King training game for the Philips CDI. There's also the Hill in Garden Inn game for the PSP where you learn how to clean. Riveting gameplay. I recall my first ever job at KFC had a training game, but it was one of those lazy flash games with PNGs of paid actors pretending to be employees and some Go Animated Jason animations. Not the same thing, but still interesting to note. This game was made to help train brand new employees in how to cook and prepare food served by McDonald's. There was also a separate version for already established employees called eSmart. For what they are, there's a lot of charm in these games. The eCrew development program and its eSmart counterpart were never meant to be seen by the public. They were internal projects given to employees of a burger franchise. Anyone in the world now being able to play these games for free via emulation, seeing all the assets and work put into a video game made to train McDonald's employees from a country you're not even from, it's wild to me. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that this game had little quizzes to show off what you learned. It also shows you how to clean up and manage the McDonald's floor too. I can clean the bathrooms, but it says nothing about how to wipe the shit off of the mouth urinals. I didn't just learn to mop the floor from the McDonald's training game. I sat my ass down and listened. I would have read it, but I can't read Spanish. I can't read Japanese. I have no clue what this means. Though I listened intentionally since the music in this game is really good. I hate it when people say, oh, why does this so go so hard? The composer for this, the composer of this video game didn't have to do this much because fun fact, they did have to go this hard and they were getting paid for it. But I think in this case where the game is probably in the hundreds of copies, possibly even less, I have to ask why the music is so good.
I think every workplace should have video games to play in order to learn and train for the job. I know it sounds like a joke, but it's far more engaging and enjoyable. Though, I guess it's a bit harder to create a game around working in retail, for example. But if they can create a game telling me how to fold a goddamn dowel, they can create a game telling a 16-year-old how to bag some old hag's groceries. This is Bubble Bobble Revolution on the DS. Pretty standard Bubble Bobble fare here. This cover sucks, but I've seen worse. You kill the enemies, you finish the stage, you bub the bob. It has overall negative ratings due to shit graphics and bad level design, both of which are true. But it is still a Bubble Bobble experience at the end of the day. You'd be surprised, but it's really hard to fuck up Bubble Bobble. And they somehow managed to fuck it up. You can play in classic mode, where you play what is essentially a one-to-one -one conversion of the original 1980s Bubble Bobble arcade game. Classic even has a co-op mode, so if you had a friend who owned Bubble Bobble Revolution, you could use the DS's download feature to play together. I lack a friend to play with, so I guess I'll just never know what that's like. There's also New Age Mode, which is where most of the complaints seem to stem from. There's bosses every 10 levels, there's fans around some of the levels so you can use the DS microphone, and this mode even features a 4 player mode instead of a co-op called Revolution. Of any Bubble Bobble game that I've played, this is the lowest ranking one. Granted, most of my Bubble Bobble experience comes from like, Rainbow Island on the SNES, but from what I've played of Bubble Bobble itself, like, this is borderline unplayable too stiff, clunky, genuinely unfun. It's more aggravating than enjoyable, but I guess I can say that I'm enjoying myself. Ah! <laughs> hey, Jerry. I mean, Mel. I'm practicing how to drive, I swear. Although you should be learning how to drive, I'm more worried about why you're covering this game. I mean, it's bad for sure, but it's not really that weird. Why are you in my house? Oh, Mel. I'm always in your house. Anyway, what's with the game? Well, uh, the, I don't know, but I did just get to level 30. Uh, might as well keep playing. So this game is broken. 70% of the game is completely unplayable. And I don't mean unplayable as in, oh my gosh, this is so difficult to play, or oh gosh, this reeks, this is so unfun. I mean like, this game has a bug that makes it physically impossible to play further than level 30, meaning 70 levels are unreachable to the player. The bug is that the level 30 boss never spawns, meaning you cannot proceed. How it was not found during development is beyond me. It's beyond me how the game was released when it plays this bad, but this bug tops the fucking cake. It's not present in the PAL or Japanese versions, only the NTSC versions. Maybe there was no playtesting? Some sources say it was probably something wrong with the game and no one noticed, others say it may have happened during production. So. Who at Codemasters is responsible for this? I ought to ask them. It happened 16 years ago. I feel like if the incident is old enough to drive a car, it's old enough to be explained. What's Codemasters phone number? They're owned by EA? So you're telling me EA owns this? They own me too. Back in the day, there was no downloadable updates for games. The way they fixed them before DLC and stuff was to have them shipped back to Nintendo or to create a whole new updated cartridge. Pokemon Emerald had an interesting one where when connected to a copy of Ruby or Sapphire, it would update a glitch in those games where the berry trees wouldn't properly replenish. Another weird one is Skyward Sword, where a very specific scenario would softlock your game. The Nintendo released a patch channel for the Wii to update the game. But what happened to Bubble Bobble Revolution? So as early as eight days after the the game was released. In response to releasing a genuinely unplayable experience, Codemaster acknowledged the flaws and released a statement saying, We have been looking very hard into this issue with Nintendo and have now determined that all of the cartridges that have been shipped in North America are faulty. Needless to say that we are extremely sorry that this situation has arisen and would like to apologize to you for this issue. We have already started the process whereby a corrupted version is to be manufactured and will ensure that all customers have their copies replaced. Unfortunately, this can take 8 to 10 weeks simply because of the time 
time required to manufacture the new carts. We will update you with what you will need to do to get a replacement game as soon as this has been determined. Within the year, Codemasters put out an updated version that replaced the unplayable ones with a practically identical one. Oddly enough, I can't find any information on how these were shipped out. Did people have to ship in their broken copies and in return they'd receive a new updated one? Were they sent to retailers for when games were returned? Could people just mail in and get a new copy and keep their old one? That whole part of the situation is shrouded in 16 years, so who knows? Now, the only difference between these two is that on the new one, it has a small dash one at the end of the USA on the cover, the cartridge, and the manual. Along with that, they also threw in a free copy of Rainbow Island Revolution. Pretty standard Rainbow Island fare here. This cover sucks, but I've seen worse. You kill the enemies, you finish the stage, you rain the bow. It's so unbelievably hard to see the differences between the defective and updated versions of Bubble Bobble Revolution that you often see these much rarer copies sell for prices as low, if not lower, than the defective copies. I recall seeing the USA-1 copies selling for as much as $6 hundred dollars when people first realized that there was a different version. But those days are gone now. In order to enjoy the full 3 out of 10 experience that is a Nintendo DS's first of two Bubble Bubble games by the standards of mid-2023, you'll only need to spend about $150 or keep an eye out on eBay like I am, hoping to catch some unexpecting seller who doesn't know that they own one of the rarest DS games out there. I'll own it someday. Mark my words. Age of Empires The Age of Kings also had a similar story. Age of Empires is a pretty well-known series of turn-based strategy games. I may have never found them interesting, but I can see the appeal. I played Romance of Three Kingdoms on the SNES, and I played Pokemon Conquest and uh, Mario Plus Rabbids. I know enough about turn-based strategy that I could possibly need, and adding a fourth franchise to that list would cause my brain to explode. Age of Empires 2 was released in 1999 on the PC and later on the DS in 2006. It received a lot of favorable reviews and even an award or two. However, there was one small bug. If you were to name your character something that was under four characters, your game would crash, break, and be completely unusable as it was now bricked. The developers of Backbone Entertainment had no way around this, as it just couldn't be fixed. Unlike what happened with Bubble Bubble Revolution, they couldn't just find a way to fix the issues with the game. So instead of releasing a new version like Codemasters did, they just started including a small slip of paper in every copy to warn buyers about the bug. Here I have my copy that I've yet to play. Before starting a campaign, make sure that your empire name, save file name, is four or more characters in length. To edit the empire name, select user profile, then select edit profile and enter the name. This will avoid any loss of data. All of this poor grammar followed by a thank you. It feels like they had to rush this into the box and had no time to proofread it, but you know me, I'm a rebel. Fuck the system. I'm gonna name myself Mel. I wasted $10 for this gag. So a fun fact before we move on. This glitch will not work unless the save data you're working with is fresh. You have to change from the default name to a name of three or less characters in order to waste $10 for a speed run. As you can see in the background, I didn't immediately know this and tried to do it several times before taking a shot in the dark and resetting the whole profile. What a fascinating little glitch. Now on to weird inclusions. So a lot of video games come with things that are in the package, not just the cartridge or manual, but sometimes a little added goodie here and there. You get the game and also a funny little extra to add to the experience. Sure, you could open up the newest Pokemon game and enjoy it for a week, but you could also open up the Snow Brothers Collector's Edition and play with the Stress Ball Snowball for months on end. Games have done this for a long time. Something like Earthbound came in a big ass box and included a player's guide. However, it wasn't a a popular trend until the DS and Wii era. So many weird doohickeys thrown into random games that usually don't enhance the experience or just make it incredibly hard to find or afford. Like, I'd kill to show you all the Kinect's Gravedigger that I could build that came with Monster Jam Path of Destruction, but I can't find the fucking thing, man. In the late 2000s and early 2010s, funny shaped rubber bands that kids would lacerate their wrists with became the new fad. Since the dawn of time, there's always been a new hit toy for kids to choke on that tended to lead to lawsuits from stupid and rich entitled parents. Silly bands were a huge craze, and as with any craze, big companies were going to try to capitalize off of it. There were knockoffs, a late to the party movie. Is that an airplane band? Awesome! And a glow-in-the-dark light bulb? 
Ooh, I want the rock star. And the TV. Cool. But what's this one? It's a circle. Nobody has one like this. But the topic right now is the video game. 2010 was probably when these lawsuits to be reached their peak and the Nintendo DS game was released. It has the official silly band's name and everything. Surely with a hugely profitable company behind them, it should be an incredible game. Now, to be fair, Angry Birds didn't touch a Nintendo console for almost two years after this, so this was feeding that hungry demographic of fifth graders who didn't have a phone smart enough to fling avians. So it's nothing more than an Angry Birds clone. Luckily for me and my rational fear of unnecessarily shaped rubber bands marketed towards children as a collectible that were banned in several public schools, this is just digital silly bands. There's no actual silly bands here, so I'm perfectly safe. Let's open this sealed copy I bought on eBay. I paid $2 for this. Such a good deal. All right, here we go. Ah! Here I am inside of my local Walmart, or as I call it, my quarantine zone. So Silly Bands on the DS came with a pack of video game shaped Silly Bands. There they are, foot is taken from my house, which is currently being fumigated to eradicate the Silly Bands. They're an invasive species. You see one in your house and they're everywhere. Ah! With the DS being in that era of casual gaming, there's a lot of health related games. There were so many that were trying to help you learn how to cook, which feels like an actually useful tool. One of the many ways to be healthy is to walk. So of course, the Nintendo DS had to have games to help people understand how to walk. Unlike cooking, however, the act of walking is much more difficult and there was clearly a need for a game or two to help you understand exactly how to. This is Personal Trainer Walking, a Nintendo published game that uses a packaged in pedometer to help you track your steps. Not a pedometer, I've heard that one before. And hey, Hey, why not a second one too? Two pedometers, one for me and one for the family dog. Before we look at this game, I want to show you all this Amazon video I found. Walking is a great way to clear your head, boost your energy, and it's a wonderful time to bond with family and friends. It's easy to do, you don't really need a lot of equipment, and you can do it just about any time or any place. In fact, that's probably why it's one of America's favorite physical activities, with over 111 million regular participants. 111 million regular participants in walking. Is this per day? What kind of statistic is this? Surprisingly, over 8 billion people per day actively participate in breathing. Personal trainer walking can keep track of data for up to four people, so the whole family can get involved. You can even set up a profile for your dog to keep track of your furry friends steps too. My furry friends? I want to make it I want to make it very clear that I wrote the family dog joke before I watched this. I have a sixth sense to predict stupid video game related things, I guess. This is one of very very few games on the DS to use Miis. You could even transfer them straight from your Wii. There were five total games that used this feature, two of which being released in America. The only other American DS game to utilize Miis is Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Echoes of Time. So to the normal man, there was one. The other three were Japan only titles, and as I've learned, I can't pronounce foreign words very well, so I'm not even gonna try. Let's get on to Personal Trainer Walking, or at least in Europe as Walk With Me. Do you know your walking routine? Well, golly, I ought to learn quick. Might as well test the pedometer myself. It seems like it won't work with my new Nintendo 2DS XL, so let's try my childhood DS. Maybe this beaten up red DS? Never know, maybe it only works with an older model. The date setting of the Nintendo DS system is May 19th of the year 2000. What? Fix the damn clock and... Nothing. Maybe after all these years, the fucker done died. Well, as it turns out, I'm just an idiot and it needed a new battery. Okay, so let's get my me transferred on here, set up our profile, and we're good to go. Time to walk. I've walked that much? I'm so healthy. I should try to use personal trainer cooking. They're in the same vein, same franchise. Surely I can get that one down too. 
that was overall a bust, so how about we try a different pedometer? This is my weight loss coach. The measuring tape feels both rude and pandering, but I feel like a DS game inadvertently telling me to lose weight makes me want to lose weight. Bit of a different looking pedometer, as unlike the Nintendo published one that uses infrared to transfer data, this one plugs into the GBA port, meaning I can't use my personal DS and I have to use this fucking brick. Anyways, we all know what's up, it's time to go for a walk again. God damn, I am such a great walker. Maybe I should try my healthy cooking coach. Same franchise, same helpfulness. Surely this one won't go as poorly. Okay, so I'm done trying to be a walker and I'm done trying to be a cooker. I'm gonna try another DS pedometer. One that'll make me a Pokemon Trainer. Pokemon Heart Gold and Pokemon Soul Silver came with their own Pokeball shaped pedometers. That way you could take your Pokemon with you on walks to find items and catch other Pokemon. For its time, this was quoted as being one of the most accurate pedometers ever created. So if it's that accurate, I ought to give it a go. One final walk. After testing them all, I have come to a conclusion. I'm gonna trust this one for making me feel like I did more work, but this one has my A-palm on it, so I think it wins the vote for letting me feature Mr. Hand in a video proudly for everyone to see. You will not believe what I'll nickname him when he evolves. Bakugan is a franchise that I wish I could find more to talk about. A game all about balls that explode when they touch cardboard with some magnets inside of them. I talked about them briefly in a video from earlier this year, but I couldn't really say much. Though I did promise to show off the ones that I bought someday, and I sure did. Follow me on Twitter, by the way. I recently bought a bunch of them from my local quarantine zone. I own all these Bakugan, and yet I know nothing about how to play with them. That's a video for another day, though. Of the four DS Bakugan games, only two of them came with little choking hazards in the package. The first is Bakugan Battle Brawlers, which came with a little Bakugan. Now, the one that I bought didn't come with one, so I slid one of the ones that I bought earlier this year into the package, and it looks indistinguishable from the normal packaged one. If you're a Bakugan fan and this looks weird to you, everything is fine. You're hallucinating. The other one to come with something was Defenders of the Core, which had various figurines thrown in, sort of like a collect them all type deal, but you actually needed to buy a bunch of copies of the exact same game to own them all. They come with such incredible characters as... Huh? And... What? I personally got this horseshoe crab. He's pretty neat. Fits well in my mouth. Can't swallow though. Uh, 9 out of 10. Similar to Bakugan, Beyblade's DS games also had their own toy inclusion. Both of these games were based on franchises whose main priority was to sell toys to children like it was the 1980s. So of course, when selling a video game, they needed to also sell the toys. How else are you going to get kids addicted to drugs without at least giving them a free sample? Here in America, we got two games on the DS and they both had special versions that came with a Beyblade being Metal Fusion and Metal Masters. However, these aren't the ones I want to talk about. The Beyblade game Metal Fight Beyblade was never localized like the other two, remaining stuck in Japan. It came with the BPR, or Bay Point Reader. It was used to transfer Bay Points, which shows a Beyblade's wins. Overall, this was pretty useless, but it is interesting regardless. I bought one, so let's take a look at it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Melody's Beyblade Unboxing. Today, we're going to be opening up Metal Fight Beyblade for the Nintendo DS. It comes with the Bay Pointer and Bay Point Reader, which is mostly what I want to show off. I'm really excited to be able to, you know, introduce you all to these very interesting Japan-only peripherals for the Nintendo DS. So I guess without any further ado, let's... Where's the Bay Pointer at? This is just the Bay Point Reader. Google Lens, help me please. According to the back of the box, this useless win counter doesn't even come with the game, but it does come with a small GBA cart that would read the counter. For such a useless accessory to not be included, but the reader for it to be thrown in, they'd have to have not thought that out very well. I suppose I could just buy a BPR online. No one used them when they were new, so surely that means they're worthless, right? 
I don't make enough to afford this shit, man. There were plenty of games that had exclusive versions for what stores they were sold at, like Soul Bubbles, for example. One of the games in this category had two versions, and they are possibly the rarest things I've ever seen for the Nintendo DS. So rare that I honestly can't even give either of them prices. Plants vs. Zombies is a pretty standard PC game that makes for a great DS port. Out of every console version of Plants vs. Zombies, this is the definitive one that stands the test of time. It plays nice, it's classic, it's fun, is there anything else I could possibly say about it? Plants vs. Zombies had two bundle versions, one being exclusive to GameStop that came with an ugly pea shooter stylus, and the other being exclusive to Walmart that came with a Yeti figurine. I cannot explain how hard these things are to find. While working on this video, an unboxed version of the Yeti figure sold, and just a while ago, everything in the Yeti version but the game sold. And even just this month, the pea shooter one sold on Mercari for $120. I'd kill to have that ugly pea shooter stylus, but I'm a respectable person who would never have something with GameStop on it in my house. On the topic of styluses, uh, here's mine. What do you think? Real interesting ones came with obscure games, like for example, some of the early childhood rated games. You show someone this little square and it's a home branded bomb to the senses. There's not very many of these games around, but several of them are on the DS. With its huge demographic, it was bound to reach babies too like Legionnaire's Disease. Three of four of the Sesame Street games on the DS came with bigger styluses, made especially for little hands, as it says. Now, my hands are nothing near small. However, I'm not sure how these are for little hands. They're fucking huge compared to a normal-sized one. It makes my hands feel normal-sized compared to my wimpy-ass Yoshi stylus. I feel like a normal-sized stylus would make sense for a child, not something like five times the girth. Say, now that I'm thinking about it, that, uh... That DS stylus in my urethra meme has a whole new meaning with this monster. Squeeballs Party is a dumb little fucking game. 70 plus minigames. It's really funny that they can't exactly pinpoint the amount of minigames. You made the damn game, what's inside of it? There were two special versions of Squeeballs Party that came with character styluses. Three if you include this pretty rare one that came with both. Here's the one I have. No clue what his name is, so let's call him... Lorg. There's PTSD in those eyes. However, there was a really interesting unreleased DS peripheral that was tied to this game. It seems like it was intended to work like a Wii remote for the DS. As this article says, it could have been used to, quote, hit a home run by swinging the stylus off of the DS screen. It was planned to have LEDs and motion controls. Pretty innovative, but it feels like that would have been way too many things to be packed into something that just didn't need it. However, I think I would have loved to see this happen. The thought of a Wii remote for the DS is incredible. It would have vibrated, so on the stylus inside of the urethra tier list, this one goes on the very top. Very wide, but it wiggles around, so it works out. As with Silly Bands, any fad toy of the era had its own DS game. At least one of them. A prime example of that is Zuzu Pets. These were a brand of small electronic toy hamsters that were huge in 2009, even being sold for hundreds of dollars at some points due to the demand being higher than the supply. Being as popular as they were, they naturally had their own video games. On the DS alone, there were four games that came with Zuzu inside the box. Unsurprisingly, as with all fad toys, they fell off and were quietly discontinued in 2013. Let's take a look at these bad boys. I may have them sealed, but this is for science. Please keep toy away from hair. This smells like a lawsuit. After playing with this little guy for a while, yeah, this sure doesn't add to the experience of a shitty shovelware game on the Nintendo DS. I need a pet that won't scalp me, so how about Wappy Dog? Small robot dogs were the hip and trendy thing to have a few years back, but this one was different. It came with a game. Oh, wow! Or the game came with a responsibility. It's a pretty standard pet simulator that can be played without Wappy itself, but you're really not having the full experience unless you leave him in a hot car. You can feed him, pet him, play with him. Here's the trailer advertising that you should feed your dog cake. Well, if you insist. Communicate with Wappy through your Nintendo DS. Yep, yep and watch how he responds. Woo! Care for Wappy. You need a bath. <gasps> you need a bath? That's fucking rude. This kid sucks. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, this gives me an idea. Hey, hey Lucy, how, how are you today? I don't know, I'm doing all right. How about you? You need a bath. <laughs> that, th that doesn't work, this sucks. You need a bath. You need a bath, you need a bath, you need a bath, you need a bath. You know what, Mel, bath. you know what, Mel, you know what I gotta say to that? Need a bath. Anyways, guess who's on the official Wikipedia list of robot dogs, which is pretty cool. Not everyone can say that they're living in the same neighborhood as Gaylord, the 1960s robot dog toy. 
Now, I could talk about the Mega Man Star Force wave scanner that never came over to America, the blood glucose meter that came with Knock 'em Down's World Fair, or the many music peripherals like with Guitar Hero and its guitars and drum pads, Just Sing and its microphone and headset, or Easy Piano, which came with a sliver of a piano to plug into the GBA slot of an original DS model. I could even talk about Bimoji Training, a game that helps you learn to write kanji that came with another sounding toy, or the Pokemon Typing Adventure keyboard, the Slide Adventure Mag Kid Mouse, or the the face training camera. However, the final game I want to talk about in this weird section is in the Cooking Mama series. No, none of them came with anything super crazy. Cooking Mama didn't include a Tolos Cassolette, but one of the many Cooking Mama spin-off games came with something interesting, being Crafting Mama. Most copies came with just the game and nothing else, but there were a few copies of the game that came with iron-on beads. These are pretty hard to come across. Most of the time, it's just the case that says it's on there, but it's not really in there. But there was also a special variant that came with silly bands. Now, luckily for me, my copy doesn't have that little blurb on it, meaning that I am completely safe. The house is clean of silly bands, there's no silly bands in this game, so I can kick back, relax, and open my copy of- ah! They didn't let me back in.